I told you I was gonna get nitty gritty. I'm not holding anything back. My name is Jay McGuire. I'm 44 and I was born here in Tulsa. Both of my grandparents, well, both of my grandpas were preachers, free will Baptist preachers. And so I was raised in church a lot. I've probably been in church for enough for three lifetimes. Uh, my parents met at Bible college, so it's been a huge part of my life good and bad. I have two brothers. Justin is my oldest brother and Eli is my younger brother. He's my half brother. He's my dad's son. My childhood has mixed reviews. <laughs> um, I feel like on the spectrum it probably wasn't that bad but you know everybody has a tragedy. Uh, or two to talk about that affected them in lots of ways. And my childhood consisted of church at least three times a week. That was when we didn't have revivals. Um, I was, my parents split up when I was four. So my mom moved us from Kellyville to Blackwell, Oklahoma, where her parents lived. And she was a single mom and she had her parents to help her, but she had three part-time jobs and she went back to college so she could support us. So she was a college student full-time. The divorce affected her very deeply, being from a religious household. You know, she had a lot of expectations for herself that weren't met, so she fell into depression. She read a lot, a lot of romance books. So ironically, it was very difficult to get her attention away from those romance books, and now I'm a romance author. <laughs> a lot of times when people out and about, one of the first things they ask is, what do you do? And I'll say, I'm self-employed, but I've since heard that um, strippers say that. So I've started saying, I'm in publishing. <laughs> Providence is the first book I ever wrote, yes. Thank you, it's actually new. This one's kind of bended, bent. So I actually uh, created this cover with the help of my older brother, Justin. Um, not this particular color cover, but this is actually like uh, the third or fourth cover. We just recently redid all the covers so they would all match. The very first cover I created, and then my brother helped me like with this cutout area, and then I did it and figured out how to have it at the right resolution and all those things, and then uploaded it whenever I first self-published. This is my first book. It was heavily inspired by Twilight, as we all know, inspired my writing career. And so I'd already had this idea of what I wanted to do because I played The Sims in my early 20s and they have this function on it where you can take still shots and then write underneath it and you can write stories, make up stories with each still shot. So I was already writing the story of Jared and Nina and how she wa he was her bodyguard and fell in love with her. But then I wanted, like, I need, it needs some oomph. It needs, it needs something. And it was already heavily inspired by Twilight, so I decided to go the paranormal route. But it's not vampires. It's angels and demons, which with my own personal religious background, I got to really dive into theology and explore a lot of stuff. So. It was really fun for me. And it's, you know, it's my firstborn, so it's kind of sentimental. My childhood was not something I would want to repeat again. Uh, I would call my religious experience borderline abusive. We were in church if we were running a fever, if we were vomiting. Um, there was a lot of judgment. A lot of my family members were elders in our church. Our family was very dysfunctional. We had a lot of sexual abuse in our family that those elders in the church were part of. So I had a very skewed view of religion mixed with abuse. It's not something that we talked about, so I don't know who else it involved. As an adult, um, I struggled with religion, so I fell away for a long time, and I was a full-blown atheist for a long time. And then I was agno 
agnostic and then I was spiritual and just in the last year or so I've started going back to church and trying to rebuild a new relationship with God and uh, try to figure all of that out. Though that's probably a lot of memories that cloud much of my childhood and then you know as a skinny ginger growing up in a farm town poor with a single mother uh, I was bullied very heavily and uh, that fills up a lot of my childhood memories is um, the bullying that I endured and then obviously an absentee father that was not involved but his father, my papa, preach. He was a paternal figure to me. And even though he was two hours away, he always facilitated any kind of relationship I had with my father. And he made sure that we had what we needed. My coping mechanisms for bullying, like I said, my mother was largely emotionally unavailable. She was, she was a very good mother. She made sure we, she, had everything we needed despite having to do everything alone, having that many jobs, going to college, and then graduating and having a pretty decent job in the tiny town that we lived in. She made sure we had everything we needed. She made sure we lived in a clean home and had, she cooked three meals a day, and, but she was very timid. She does not like conflict at all. So that left me to fight all of my own battles. I feel like caused me to overcompensate, not just as a child, but now as an adult and a mother. The lessons I learned from the bullying that I endured and essentially being left alone to handle all of that on my own, I, obviously it made me stronger. I'm not afraid of conflict, probably to a fault and I'm fully capable of defending my children and, and taking care of them as needed, but I don't feel like, because I had no direction, I didn't learn how to do it in a healthy way. And so in my adult life, I've really focused on working on myself and doing uh, self-reflection and growth in that department specifically to Remember that when people come at you, it's not personal. It's more of a reflection of themselves. To not be so reactive in how I handle people, especially I feel like all of that that I endured in my childhood aided me in a lot of very important ways to handle being in the public eye now in my career and dealing with the criticism and the negative reviews and what people don't understand is authors, we don't just, you know, oh, I got, I got a bad review and they hate my work or I suck or people, because of the age of the internet, they take it further. They say, I can't believe you would write an alpha male. This is borderline abuse. This is abusive. I feel sorry for your children for having a mother like you. You must have been abused. Uh, by your husband or your boyfriend and we experience cheap shots daily all day we're inundated with it and if you don't develop a thick skin very quickly you're not going to be able to handle it and you're going to tap out but because of my childhood and the constant barrage of bullying that I received from not just girls, it was mostly boys, to be honest with you. I used to be a basketball manager for the boys and there was this one boy in particular, I won't name him because he's since passed away. He would sit behind me on the bus and spit loogies in my hair and I would go home and have to wash his snot out of my hair after ball games. And the coaches and the teachers, a small town and they just never did anything about it. But all of that built me in a way for this, to be able to handle this and still know who I am as a person and know that what they say, that I'm not who they say I am. The story of this cover, well, this is Jared 
on the front. And the, the original is similar, it's just a different color scheme. And it's basically him walking. Everyone always asks what he's carrying. I think it's Nina's jacket, because he's always taking care of her. I'm just showing him walking through a forest and he's walking towards the light, which is interesting because it's angels and demons. And what I really like about this book is yeah, it's angels and demons, but Jared and his brother and sister are hybrids. Their dad is an archangel and their mom is human. And part of their curse is for, well, they're part of their father's curse for falling from heaven and falling in love with a human is that they then become tied to their, the humans that they're guarding. And they, are biologically intertwined with them. So basically saying, okay, you already fell from heaven, so to make sure you do your job as a guardian angel, you're biologically tethered to your, it, in Hebrew, it's Hebrew, it's called tele. It's their, their human, their guarding. To make sure that they do their job, they're biologically tied to them, so if the human dies, they die. But in Jared's case, he fell in love with his, and he's got even more of a reason because she's part of a prophecy and hell wants her dead. So his job is really tough in addition to being in love with her, so. What's the overall message that you Does it have an overall message? I don't know that it does. It's, it's about love, it's about self-sacrifice, it's about unconditional love, wanting the best for your partner, even if that means that it's a life without you in it. It's. A happy ending as all my books are and it's the first of a series of five books and it's one of the reasons why I wasn't going to publish Beautiful Disaster it sat on my computer for a year I wasn't I just wrote it for me I wasn't gonna publish it which ironically it became my first New York Times bestseller but Providence has a very intricate plot and I'd never been it's set at in Providence Rhode Island at Brown University and I had never been there I didn't, I was a single mom. I didn't have the money to go there and, and I was in x-ray school. So I just had to do a lot, a lot, a lot of research because I don't always get everything right, but I want to make sure that my books are as authentic as I can possibly make them. Then I got, some years later, I got to go to Providence and see it for myself. And it was kind of a spiritual experience. <laughs> I, I liked to write books that are like set in Oklahoma or in and around Oklahoma or the South because it's easier because you have to spend time looking up ridiculous things like do people in this region call their couch a sofa or a couch or a divan? Like you have to look up little things like that. So it's, it takes a lot longer to write a book that's oh, not wow. set. I did have best friends. I had two best friends that were twins, Brooke and Bridget. I needed them in a lot of ways. They were very strong girls who grew up to be very strong women. And we both came from broken homes. They had three older brothers that were really funny and fun to be around and I wasn't close with my older brother. So that was nice and it was kind of a home away from home. Uh, one of the twins was um, very mean. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I, but I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot from her. I learned how to stand up for myself. And there were times when, you know, she really came in clutch and she was there for me, but most of the time it was a very one-sided friendship. That taught me what I didn't want in a friend. Those are the only lessons that you learn is, I never learn anything when it's easy. Everything that I've learned is because it was hard. I grew up in Blackwell. I went to school in Blackwell, kindergarten through 12th grade. It was awful. I hated every minute of, and no one could ever pay me to repeat high school or middle school again, ever again. Uh, I hated it. I nearly dropped out several times. I almost didn't graduate, which is funny because when I went on to college, I was a straight A student, principal was on a roll. I was just miserable and I didn't want to be there and I didn't care. It was the bullying, but also just, I felt alone. I, it wasn't, you know, it was 25 years ago plus. So I didn't have, the mentality back then was, you know, kids will be kids and just ignore it and it'll go away, but it never went away. In addition to my mother not wanting conflict and having that ignore and it'll go away attitude, then you have your, the teachers who just 
sit there and watch someone brutally and verbally just beat you up and watch it happen and just let it happen and you just feel helpless and, and a lot of times when I try to defend myself I would get in trouble for it so there's a lot of victim blaming and don't fight back and things like that there's not a lot to do in Blackwell and although I can look back on my hometown fondly ish <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot of good memories there I graduated in 1997 and I remember standing on the stage and crying and people looking at me thinking, oh, that's so cute. And I was so relieved yeah. that it was over. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't really have any aspirations. I guess to be a wife and a mother, that was really what a little girl from small town Oklahoma could hope for, I guess. Certainly wasn't a New York Times bestseller. I thought they were from New York. And I'd always written it never even occurred to me that I could write a full-length novel. I didn't have a single person, not one person in my childhood that ever encouraged any kind of dreams I might have had. So I honestly didn't have a dream. I guess maybe when I was little, I wanted to be a famous singer. My dad's side of the family are all very musical, and they would, had a stage up on their church, um, up at the front of their church. and. You know, my papa played the guitar, my nanny played the piano, and they both sang, and my Uncle Gary played the piano, and my Uncle Eric played the bass, and my dad played everything. He was the most talented musician still to this day that I've ever met. And I know some very famous, talented musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, if you didn't play a musical instru instrument in that family, then you better be able to sing. Mm -hmm. So we got up a lot and sang. And my papa's family, they actually have records. They have stacks of records. Some of them are in my office. They were the McGuire family gospel singers. And you can see my dad growing up in those records. And when my parents got married, my mom was on a few of those records. You know, some people think they're gonna be an astronaut or I thought maybe I might be a singer, but I never actually thought it would happen. It was just, you know, pretend. Uh, next in line of uh, the books I wrote was Beautiful Disaster. This is actually, this is, this is a self-published copy, which there are not many left in existence. They're bigger and they don't have the Atria mark on it. The Atria is a division of Simon & Schuster, which is who I did my book deal with. And, but I just, it's got a new cover now, so this is pretty sentimental. And we, I had a guy, I commissioned a guy to do this one. And I just told him to do whatever he wanted because I didn't know. And so this is what he did. And I've had a lot of people tell me that it was, it looks paranormal because of the cover, but it's not. So it kind of threw people off at first. And it's much better than the original cover, which was a open mouth with a tattooed tongue. And people always ask me if they can have that, but that was only ebook for a little bit until I changed the cover. That was the second book I wrote. And like I said, I didn't have any plans to publish it. It was just for me. It's not written with your typical, because I'm not a huge reader, um, and I grew up on soap operas, it's not written with your typical story arc. It's like this, like a soap opera. You know, they get along, they don't. They get along, they don't. That just kept people turning the pages and they never read anything like that before. Besides the fact that when I wrote Providence, I was declined across the board by every agent I queried to try to get it published because they said that no one was reading characters that who were in college and they told me to change it to either high school or adult and I was like no I don't want to like this is what I like to read and I'm not a big reader so if I like to read it then somebody is gonna like to read it so I, I left it the way it was so I wrote Beautiful Disaster next and then I wrote the sequel to Providence which is Requiem and this is Requiem it has Nina as the cover on the cover and it's just beautiful because her dress is translucent it's so pretty but um so i wrote requiem but while i was it was in editing people kept bugging me and saying i mean bugging me in the best possible way when's your next book coming out and i had beautiful disaster sitting on my computer and i didn't want to publish it because i thought after writing something like providence they're going to think this is fluff because it's just about a relationship, a dysfunctional relationship. I was just like, 
at the time, I only had, you know, 40, 50 sales a month, so I didn't think anybody would read it. So I was like, here, read. I just went over it once. I didn't even send it to like an editor. I just read over it once and posted it, put it up on Amazon for people to read. And the first month, I think it sold like 45 copies. And then like right after that, it sold like 30,000 or something stupid. So, uh, and then they hit the New York Times. Beautiful Disaster was very polarizing. People either loved it or hated it, but either way they were talking about it. So I got lucky. So Beautiful Disaster is heavily based off of my college experience. I went to a very small college, so a lot of people are like, did this author even go to college because this is nothing like college? And I'm like, yeah, it is. It's just a small college and you're not used to teeny tiny colleges that are literally probably the size of your high school. So it was heavily based off of my college experience. I even have some of my professors in it. Some of the guys that I was friends with in college who were football players. Jason Brazil is real. Shepley is real. Um, he's a friend of mine on Facebook still. I still know. Brazil and Gruber was a real person. Uh, America is actually my best friend in college. Her name is Robin, and but I changed her name to kind of stand out. And then I didn't even think about it because a girl that I went to x-ray school with, her best friend was named America. And I thought that was really unique, so I want to use it. But then I realized that I also had Jason Brazil. So there's a Brazil because he's a football player and they all call each other by their last names. And there's also an America, which I didn't even think about at the time, but people pointed out to me as they always do. <laughs> Brazil's name is actually spelled differently in real life as B-R-A-Z-E-A-L, but I didn't want there to be confusion on how it was pronounced, so I just spelled it like the country. There was no main message. No main message. It was literally just fluff and love and uh, like a soap opera. Like they get along, they don't. They get along, they can't figure it out, and it was just it's just fun to read. Like, and I don't try to have a message for my books. I just want them to be entertaining. I mean, the world sucks and people read for an escape and I want them to be entertained and I that's why I do happy endings because life is hard enough. Why would you read about something sad? I just don't understand it. A lot of times when people are asked what love is, they talk about what they want in a person. You know, I want someone who's kind, I want someone who's taller than six feet, who does well, uh, successful, attractive funny, the life of the party, you know, everybody has their different preferences. But as I've gotten older, I've realized that love is patience, pretty much everything it talks about in the Bible. It's kindness, it's understanding, and not just communication, it has to be an understanding and a willingness to know that it's not me against you, it's us against the problem. As I've gotten older, I've learned that even though I've had several failed relationships and marriages, that it's just a willingness to forgive over and over and over because if you're in a relationship with someone for you to be happy, it will inevitably fail. You have to be happy first. And I've taken the last year to really dig deep because I was never alone my entire adult life, I'd never been alone until last year. I had my daughter when I was 20, and before that I had a college roommate, before that I lived with my mother. So I've never lived alone. And now as a single mother, there are stints like this week where I, I am alone. And before I'd always either been married or had a boyfriend, and um, I didn't like it. I didn't like being alone. But I've really learned to enjoy it, and I've really learned what I like to do by myself. I've learned to enjoy alone time with me and be in my own space and not have to compromise my own space or compromise what I want to watch or where I want to eat. It's actually been very eye-opening and I've really enjoyed it. But most of all, I've learned that I love hanging out with me and that in turn gave me a lot of self-esteem that I never had previously. I know that I have a lot to offer, that I bring a lot to the table and that in turn has made me realize that I don't ever have to settle again. And if no one extraordinary comes my way, I'll be fine. I've been married twice, which is funny because a lot of people love to, you know, being public on the internet. 
I, people love to make jabs about, you know, that I'm a romance author and I have two failed marriages. But I learned more from those failed marriages than I ever would getting married at 18 or even 25 or 30 and never learning more about myself than who I am as a part of a couple. So I'm okay with it. I can't say that there's anything about that facet of my life that I regret because it's molded me into a person that I'm very proud of. Well, there's a lot of reasons. One of the reasons was because that was when self-publishing was still a dirty word and as a self-published author, I could, I could put it at a price point that was very competitive. And then also, I was in a group, a Facebook group with some other authors and we were all reading each other's books and talking about them. And authors try to do that now with their groups, but it's not authentic and people can tell. We were all just reading each other's books and really enjoying them and talking about them on our social media. So that happened. And then the third thing was that Fifty Shades of Grey had come out and then everyone was talking about Fifty Shades of Grey and what to read next. And inevitably my books, I don't know why, because they're not erotica, but my books would come up as what you should read after Fifty Shades of Grey. That's actually how my assistant, who's now my assistant, Jessica, she found me and my books is because she was looking up what to read after Fifty Shades of Grey. And she found my book. And oh, now she has it tattooed on her arm. <laughs> Beautiful disaster absolutely changed my life. Yeah, it's, it was, uh, it's a book about a boy that I actually had a crush on in college. So Travis Maddox is real, but that's not his name. And there's obviously a lot of fiction. The guy I had a crush on in college was an underground fighter and he didn't have tattoos. He didn't even drive a motorcycle. But he was very, very good looking and I had a huge crush on him and we were just like, I was his buddy, you know? And all of our guy friends, because I was friends with half the football team, they threw me my birthday party, which is in the book. My 19th birthday party. And they all, all tell me like, he's, a college kid, like he's not one to settle down and you're the kind of girl that you've settled down with, so he's just gonna be your friend right now. It's devastated me. But then I dropped out of college and had a baby and I was in x-ray school one day and I had fantasized many times about how I was gonna run into this guy again. And I was standing there in hugely baggy navy blue faded scrubs because I had lost a bunch of weight because I was getting a divorce. And I was wearing no makeup and my hair was piled on top of my head. And here he comes walking around the corner, completely different town, an hour and a half away from where we went to college. He comes walking around the corner and he's like, and I was like, oh my God, I thought like my hair was gonna be blowing like Beyonce the next time I saw him. No. And then I was nervous. So he was telling me that he had gotten married and they just had a baby and his life was perfect. And I was like, I'm broke and I'm in x-ray school and I'm getting a divorce and my life sucks, you know? Um, and then he walked away and I was like, oh God. I called my best friend on the way home from x-ray school and I had a long drive, I had an hour and 15 minute commute. And so I called her on the way home and told her about it. And she was like, you should write about it and write your happy ending. So that's what I did. So a lot of my college experiences are in that. The, a lot of that is nonfiction. And then there's a whole lot of fiction thrown in. Oh my God, I lost so much sleep. When I first found out, my very first big check from Amazon for Beautiful Disaster was, it hit like top 100 on Amazon and it was $12,000. And I was on food stamps at the time. I mean, it changed my life. I lost so much sleep trying to figure out what I was going to do with that money because I knew it was never gonna happen again. So I really wanted to make sure that I like put money in my kids' savings accounts for college and I paid a big chunk of my car off and you know, just, I was making lists upon lists upon lists about how exactly to spend that money because I knew it was never gonna happen again. And the next month I made double and the next month I made double that and then double that and then I was making six figures a month and then the publisher started calling because I'd hit the New York Times by that point. It's not just changed my life, it's changed my children's lives. It's, I bought my mom a house and uh, it's changed the lives of strangers. I had a blogger who passed away and I left small children behind and I paid for her funeral, I paid for divorces, I paid for adoptions uh, and you know, your random, pay for somebody's groceries. I had a lady once who her card 
wasn't working and so I just paid for her groceries and I've sent people on vacations and helped them make memories with their children and I've made lots of donations to the Alzheimer's Foundation and that's not what it's called. My uncle Brad, uh, my papa had Alzheimer's and then I've also made donations to uh, the MS charity which there's a couple of them, but there's one in particular that my Uncle Brad, because he has MS, he asks uh, me to donate to that one in particular. And then children's charities and wounded warriors, vets, those are the kind of things I like to, to donate to. So Beautiful Disaster has changed more than just my life. It's changed, who knows, who knows how many lives it's changed. Mm -hmm. And that's not including my readers who come to me every day, or almost every day, mm -hmm. and say, I was going through this and this book got me through it or my child died and that was the only thing that helped me distract me uh, while I healed or got me through this horrible time in my life or my divorce or my mom dying or my mom having cancer. Just so many messages over the last 12 years where people have told me that that book that I thought no one would read got them through one of the worst times of their lives. So it's changed more than just my financial situation. I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, my first husband and I fairly amicably divorced. We got married when we were really young. And, you know, we had kids very young and we were both from the same small town and really we were just both the best option at the time. And there came a point where we just realized that we didn't really have anything in common. I decided to go back to school so I would be able to support my two girls by myself. And while I was in x-ray school, I met my second husband. And we were together for three years. And I was actually looking for houses to move south of where we were living because we lived together. Uh, because I knew that that wasn't what I wanted and then I found out that I was pregnant with my son and because of my experiences with my daughters and the back and forth and I knew it was just not a healthy situation for them they didn't like it they complained about it a lot I kind of felt like I'd made my bed so I was just gonna lay in it so I got married again which I said I would never do again <laughs> we were married for a long time but we could not have been more opposite like I love to talk and chat and have deep conversations and I remember there's a point in our marriage where I was like, okay, like this is, this is the time when you like give me feedback, like you, this is the part where you talk back. Cause he just, we were so opposite. He, he told me he literally had no thoughts in his head. Uh, he was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, what do you think about what I'm saying? I was so desperate to like connect with him and He's like, well, I don't, I don't have any thoughts. I'm just listening to you. And that's the first time I realized that there are some people in the world who don't have internal monologue. There are some people that don't have that. They don't have voices in their head. Mine is constant. So that was kind of a huge realization for me about the human condition in general, how different people are and that we don't even think the same. I bought 30 acres and I built a house for us and he didn't work. He was a stay-at-home dad. And then we decided to move to Colorado and we lived there for three years and we were just bleeding money and I couldn't figure out why. And so we decided to move, I decided to move back to Oklahoma. We bought 50 acres out here and had this beautiful house on the hill. And about two weeks after we closed, uh, I realized that my husband was moving money into an account that I didn't know about. And then a few weeks later, uh, he took my plane down to Midland, Texas, and that led me to the girl he'd been seeing, which was probably where the money was going. But So we ended up getting a divorce, and I was relieved when we got a divorce because it was just, it was never easy. It was always a struggle, being with someone who's so different from you. The only regret I had about it was my son and that again, I had a second failed marriage. And there's such a stigma that goes along with that. And it's not ironic to me, or it doesn't, it's not lost on me that I'm a romance author. <laughs> so so I, I wanted him to have what I didn't have. I wanted him to have 
you know, two parents who were married, who were stable, and he could experience life and milestones with both of his parents right there. Not having the back and forth, the visitation, it's really, really hard on him. He did not adjust well after the divorce, and it's the back and forth is really, really hard on him. He's a big mama's boy, so it's been really tough on him. Well, that was always the plan. Like, I was always going to write. After Providence, and I realized people would actually what I, read what I wrote, it didn't matter if it was a full-time job because I'd gone to x-ray school, and I was an x-ray tech at the time. So I had a backup plan. It was never the plan to be a full-time writer, but I put out my first book. I wrote my first book in 2009, put it out in 2010, put out Beautiful Disaster in 2011. By 2012, I was writing full-time and had already retired from x-ray. Uh, I was going into the ERs and the doctors were like, by that time I'd had a book deal and a movie deal. And they're like, why are you still here? You make more than we do. I just want to make sure it's stuck. <laughs> what was next? A uh, walking disaster. Why well, I finished the Providence series because I wanted my readers who enjoyed that to finish it out. So I finished the Providence series and I wrote Walking Disaster. And I wrote that when I was pregnant with my son. And I had already had a book deal that was the second book in a two book deal with Atria. And so I was finishing that out. And I wanted to be finished before I had him because I wanted to concentrate. I knew he was gonna be my last baby. And I wanted to concentrate on those first few months and being a mom. So I worked and worked and worked on it. And then I started feeling contractions. And so I worked even harder. And then I turned, I worked all night one night and I turned the book in at like 8 a.m. and I had him at 11.14 or 11.18 that night. Yeah. No, uh, Providence is its own. It's Providence, Requiem, Eden, which I named that after my daughter. And then it has two more novellas after that. And then Beautiful Disaster is Beautiful Disaster, Walking Disaster, A Beautiful Wedding. Then you have the Maddox Brothers book, which is a spin-off, which is the main male character, Travis. He has four brothers. So it talks about all of his brothers and their love interests. I have the Crash and Burn series. That's what I'm working on right now is book three in the Crash and Burn series. And that's another spin-off of the Maddox Brothers because two of them are twins and they're hotshot firefighters. And they, it talks about the hotshot firefighters and it also talks about the security team that's in the Cheyenne Mountain Complex in Colorado Springs. And it, it talks about those people. And that's really fun because I feel like I get to start all over. It's the same series and we get to see cameos from other characters, but it's, uh, it's all new and I get to build a whole new world. And so it's pretty fun. And it's military. I really like writing about military. So it's pretty fun. I'm, I'm an action buff. I don't really watch like rom-coms or I don't watch Christmas movies or Hallmark movies or anything. I love action movies, like big blockbuster movies and even like sci-fi. My number one favorite movie is Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. Like I love horror, I love sci-fi, just anything but romance really. But I prefer to write about romance because I mean, who doesn't love love? And then um, I also like to write like Red Hill is about zombies. I love post-apocalyptic thrillers. I love all things zombies. Yeah. I really like survival and as a single mom, I would like to think that if, you know, the shit hit the fan, mm -hmm. I would be able to handle it and like keep my kids safe. So I really like to explore that part of it. And Red Hill is, I don't know, I kind of get it from both sides. People are like, there's not enough romance. And then horror people, readers are like, there's not enough gore. And, but I, I'm so interested in exploring the human condition part of like an apocalypse. So like a movie, you see it in your movie, you, you, the movies are about the characters and what they go through. It's not about the gore of it necessarily. I mean, I guess zombie movies are, but I wanted, I think about all the time if the shit hit the fan and it wasn't my weekend with my kids, how would I get to them? What would I do? How would I keep them safe? And Admittedly, I'm a, I'm a prepper. I, <laughs> I have all the things that I need for any situation to go and get my kids. And so I, I was actually cleaning houses in x-ray school for the radiologists. And one of the radiologists had a farm up in Kansas. And I would take my kids and we would all talk about how it would be a great place for us to land in case the world ends. And so that gave me an idea for Red Hill. I was 20 years old 
when I found out I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, Eden. She's now 23. And I mean, I was a kid. I grew up in a very, very religious household. And her biological father was not someone I was dating. It was someone that I knew from high school, but I just was going through a breakup and needed a distraction. And uh, I hate saying that out loud because I don't think any child should ever feel like they weren't brought into this earth with anything but love. I had her very young and to be honest with you, I didn't know what I was gonna do and I was so young and naive at the time, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do it. But not going through with it never crossed my mind. I always wanted her from the moment I knew. It changed everything. I was super wild and doing a lot of drugs and drinking a lot. I dropped out of college. I was broken hearted. And when I had her, well, when I found out I was pregnant with her, it changed everything. I went from being, having no purpose or aim in life to her being my sole focus. And every decision I made had to be a good one for her. She changed my life in the most amazing way. I'm getting emotional because <laughs> I haven't talked to her in so long. Mm. No, I don't want to talk about that. That one's kind of off limits because it's her. And she just texted me for the first time like a year, a month ago, and I don't want to mess that up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was a child when I had her and we moved around a lot and I bounced from job to job um, until I met Haley's dad. And we started dating when she was two. So he adopted her when she was four, right after we got married. Life was stable and had we stayed together, I don't know, I wonder a lot if her life would be different because when we divorced, he still remained close with Haley, his biological daughter. But then when he started dating, he gathered up all of Eden's things out of her bedroom and gave them back to me to make room for a girl that he was dating for her children. And that destroyed her. And I don't think she's ever been the same since. And I don't think Ben is a malicious person. He's a really, really good dad, but he was young too. So I do, as I think any parent does, look back and think, you know, what could I have done different? Because I, it was always in the forefront of my mind that I didn't want to be the kind of parent that my child had to heal from. I didn't want my children to have a childhood that they had to heal from. But at the same time, you just have to work with what you know and learn from it and then do better. So fortunately, unfortunately, my son gets the best version of me, the one who's wiser and more patient and more understanding. And then Eden, you know, got the kid version of me who had no clue what she was doing, wasn't the most stable parent, moving around a lot, having a lot of different jobs and just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. If I know anything, I know that, that little girl was loved. And then once my book deal started coming in, spoiled, rotten. Right before my first Amazon check came in, when my books really started taking off, we were buying school supplies. And I was a single mother and we were broke. I was on food stamps. We had went and bought school supplies and I had run out of money. I think I had like $7 left in my checking account. And she really wanted a backpack. And I remember having to explain to her, I'm sorry, I can't get you a new backpack. We're gonna have to use the old one. And you know, at that age, it's so important to have new things. And she just didn't understand it, and she was very upset. And I remember just looking at her and saying, I promise you, we will never be broke again. This is the last time we do back to school, and I can't get you everything you want. And then a month later, my first big Amazon check came in. If I wanted Eden to know one thing, she lives out in LA. And 
it's really important to me, even though we're estranged, that she's not out there walking around feeling like her mother doesn't love her. So we've had some pit, pretty hurtful moments last couple of years. I still text her sometimes and tell her I love her just because it's so important for a child to know that no matter what, no matter what, they're still loved. So right now I'm working on the third book in the Crash and Burn series, and it's Kitch's book, and he's on the security team for the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. Red Hill came out, I think, in 2013 or 2014. I won an award for it in 2014, so that might have been the year that it came out. But I'd been wanting to write it for a while before I actually got to write, got to it, because I'd had that idea for a couple of years at least. After Red Hill was Among Monsters, it's a novella, a companion novel to Red Hill. And then I wrote the Maddox Brothers series, and then I wrote uh, Happenstance, and that's set in high school. And it doesn't say my high school, but it's basically my high school, and it's, uh, my bullying experience, and it has a lot to do with bullying. But all of my books since Beautiful Oblivion, which is the first book of the Maddox Brothers series, I had a big twist at the end of that, and I just kind of got addicted to it. So now every time I write, I want there to be like at least some degree of a twist in the books. So like the book I wrote, All the Little Lights, it's got a huge, huge twist at the end that 99.9% .9 of people don't see coming because I literally wrote that book to make sure that no one knew what was happening. I think I've talked to two people. My girlfriend Kelly is reading it right now and I think she knows. But I, other than her, only one other person that I've ever spoken to has gotten it before the end, figured it out. So I'm pretty proud of that, yeah. <laughs> What people don't get is when you're creative and it's also a business, you have to be both. You have to use your right and left brain. And thank God I have the most amazing assistant in the world, Jessica Landers, and she's worked for me for eight years. And she is supernaturally loyal and patient and smart and driven in her own right. And I could not do it, what I do, without her. She literally runs every facet of my life. And she's not just that, she's a friend and she's a therapist. And to say that she has saved my life on more than one occasion is not an over-exaggeration. Over-exaggeration? An exaggeration. I've called her, particularly in the last year and a half, in the middle of the night several times. And I have children, so I don't want to not live but there were some days where I just wanted to go to sleep and not wake up. And, you know, she's been through her own childhood that kind of built her uh, for me. And she said all the right things and was very patient with me. And some, it was day after day after day for weeks and months. And she, Jessica and Jessica alone is the person who is the reason why I'm sitting here right now. Jessica was a reader. She, I met her in Texas. She's from Texas. She's a remote assistant. But I met her in Texas at a book signing, and she, there was just something different about her than everyone else. There was hundreds of people on that line, and just her energy, and she was excited to meet me, but she's an exactly fangirl. She just, I don't know, she has a very authentic, energy about her and she's never asked me for anything she's never tried to take advantage of me and that is a very unique accomplishment for someone who's in my life there are very few people who I feel have just never wanted anything from me and to only help me and help further my career and be there for me and a benefit for me and only want the best for me there have been times especially since my divorce where it came time for her paycheck to happen and she just wouldn't remind me because she wanted to make sure that I could pay my bills. She is the most loyal person I've ever met in my life. After that was the Crash and Burn series. Okay. And, and that, series? that series is a spinoff of the Maddox Brothers. It's 
about Hot Shots and the security team at the Cheyenne Mountain Complex. The second book in the series, though, is my favorite so far. I mean, I like the one I'm writing now, too. But that one, because it has Naomi in it, and she's the only female in the, on the security team, and she grew up militia. Her late husband was a Marine, and she took his place on his team in the Marines, and that's how she got to know all these guys. And so it tells her story, and she is just an absolute badass. And all of my books, the men are what I want in a man, which is like when you walk down a dark alley, you feel like you have your own personal superhero with you. You always feel safe. It's very important to me in a relationship to feel safe. And in this case, she's her own superhero, and I really, really like her character. So that was fun to write. The Maddox series was inspired because when people read Beautiful Disaster, there's a few scenes in it with all the brothers and the dad, and people, just for whatever reason, really felt a connection with the brothers and the dad. So I wanted to flesh out their stories. When I was in the third grade, a little boy by the name of Ryan Coffey, which is probably his mother, did it. But he, for my third birthday, which we were so poor, I had my third birthday at McDonald's, and that was a big deal. He brought me a gift, and it was a diary. And I wrote in that diary almost every day until every page was full. And then I asked my mom for a three ring binder and some loose leaf paper and I started writing journals. So I journaled. And in addition to that, in elementary school, I would write comic book strips of my friends and I would give them to them and like draw and then also, you know, have little dialogue bubbles. And then in high school, I wrote plays. And then in my adult life, I blogged and I had a pretty popular blog on MySpace, and then one day my best friend at the time said, you know, Jamie, everyone loved that recent blog that I wrote, I wrote about my dad. And my dad passed away when I was 21. And I was just writing how that had affected me and how I handled his death and the fact that he was largely absent. I kind of tried to hold back when he was dying and, and I was really cold and I really regretted it. I wish I would have just been his daughter and had that moment with him. And so I wrote a blog about that and it went kind of viral before things went viral. And she told me that I should write a novel. And about the same time, I went and watched the movie Twilight and I loved it. And I was talking to my roommate next to school about how much I loved it. I actually went out and bought a ticket and went right back in. She said, well, you know, they're, I was like, I can't wait till the next one comes out. I gotta know what happens. And she's like, you know, they're books, right? And I was like, what? So I asked my husband at the time, yes, I had a roommate because I went to x-ray school a year, an hour and a half away. So I stayed with a friend uh, during the week and I'd come home on the weekends. But I asked my husband at the time if he would buy me the books and he did for Christmas. And I read them, just devoured all of them and thought, I can do this. I, you know, it's not, no slam to Stephanie Meyer at all because she changed my whole life with her writing. But it's, her writing is very conversational, very easy to read. And I thought, I can do this. So I wrote, I started writing my first book, Providence. I wrote it in 11 weeks. And it was twice the size it is now, which it's over 100,000 words, which is pretty big for a romance novel. But I, it was 100 and, 84, 187,000 words when I finished it. So it was the size of two full length novels when I finished it and I wrote it in 11 weeks. Well, I was never really a big reader. I've read Sophie Kinsella. I wrote, read that when I was sick one time. And then I read the Twilight books. Uh, I read a few books in high school. But I think that's why my writing is so popular because it's, my mom watched soap operas my entire childhood. I grew up on Days of Our Lives and Another World and Santa Barbara. And actually my oldest daughter is named after character in Santa Barbara, Eden. It wasn't until I read Twilight that I was really inspired. And then since then I've read a few books from my friends who are authors, but my brain just doesn't work that way. My mom was the manager of a VHS rental store when I was little, so I just grew up around movies. And I just don't feel like I have the, I have ADD. So I don't really have the patience unless a book is really, just really grabs me. And I don't have the patience. But I also think it's, it's helped me in my career because I don't write like anyone else because I don't read. 
Yeah. Yeah. So Eden is the third book of the Providence series. It's named after my daughter. You can tell there's a baby carriage on it, so that's kind of a spoiler alert. But the other two novellas just completely throw you off. So you actually really don't know what you're getting into even after you finish this book. This is Almost Beautiful. This is my latest book that I just released back in September. It is the sequel to Beautiful Disaster, but I completely confused everybody because it's a better experience if you read all the other books, including the Maddox Brothers books, before you read this. So technically it's a sequel because it literally picks up right after they, right after Beautiful Disaster ends but there's other information in there that's not gonna make any sense to you unless you've read the other books. So I totally screwed the pooch on that one, but it's really fun. And then people get to see Travis and Abby again, and it's been a long time since they've done that, so it's fun. I don't really have any spiritual traditions. I have a very new relationship with God right now. I pray a lot. I pray a lot. But now my perception of God is more like the universe and someone who's largely hands-off but also who wants the best for you. Not so much as someone who's keeping an eye on you and waiting for you to screw up so you end up in hell. I was, I had nightmares all the time as a child uh, of going to hell and I actually developed a tick where I was incessantly saying, Dear God, please forgive me for all my sins in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Because for real bad, just don't believe in once saved, always saved. They believe that you're only saved for so long until you screw up, and then you're not saved anymore, and you have to get re-saved in front of the whole church and confess all your sins, and you never knew when that was gonna be. And then in like children's church, our youth pastor was loved to very vividly describe hell. And it was just, I constantly lived in fear of death and dying. So now my relationship with God is a lot more relaxed. I see him as, like I said, more hands off and just wanting the best for me and knowing that what I do is between me and God and he knows my heart. And I go to church now and when I, especially when I'm feeling kind of far away from him and I just need to reconnect but it's the church I go to now is very, very different than the one I went to as a child. Most joyous times by far are the births of my children and all of their accomplishments, watching them become people who I always wanted to be as a child, especially Haley. She is literally the whole package. She's two packages. She's, everyone who meets her loves her. She's popular, she's intelligent, she's a straight A student, but most of her grades, they're A's, but they're like 103, 106, 113 percent in her classes. She's also going to college right now as a senior in high school. And she is extremely athletic and can throw a ball like she's a quarterback. She was exceptional as a cheerleader. She was exceptional as a soccer player. She's exceptional as a volleyball player. Everything she does, she is amazing at. And I find myself in awe of her all the time. Eden was the same way. She was very athletic. She was an amazing cheerleader, volleyball player, track star. And then she, when she graduated, she went into acting and she's very punctual. She's very financially responsible and just all the things that I never was at their age. So while I think I inevitably made lots of mistakes as a parent, I look at them and I'm like, well, I couldn't have been that big of a screw up because they're amazing children. Yes, so Beautiful Disaster is movie one and it is a loose adaptation of Beautiful Disaster. Uh, it comes out in theaters on April 12th and then they just wrapped the second movie, but I don't know much about it. I've seen Beautiful Disaster, yes. Yeah, I, to my knowledge, I think it's the final product product, but I'm not sure, but yeah, I have seen it. Well, I've had movie deals since the very beginning. Uh, right when I got my first book deal, I also got a movie deal, and then I got series deals and TV deals with Warner Brothers, and it just never came to fruition. So it was a really cool feeling to not only have it come to fruition, but also co-write the script, which it ended up getting rewritten, so I'm not credited for it or anything, but 
it, the script is rewritten, but it's a really cool process to be part of and, and that's an area that I'm wanting to explore uh, to broaden my career and my talent. So um, I would, I really, really enjoyed that process and I would like to keep doing that. For the experience itself, it was not, I, I have friends. I, I, I was friends with Erica E.L. James who wrote Fifty Shades of Grey and I've been on that set. Mm -hmm. I'm actually in like their CD extras. I was standing there talking to Erica and Jamie, the director, and, and a couple of their producers on set and uh, it was nothing like that experience. It was very different from what I expected. Even everything from the casting to production, it was very, very different. But I, what I will say is that the cast, although they're not what people had in mind, and they, me either, it <laughs> wasn't what I had in mind, but uh, I watched it and they bring it and they are very, very talented and every single person who is on that screen does their very best to make sure that they make the readers happy and that they believe that they are the characters who they're portraying and they showed up to work every day and did their absolute best which is amazing they worked really hard and they're very talented so i really enjoyed getting the opportunity to meet each and every one of them and kind of see what they're about and one of my dear friends michael cutlets plays the dad which i myself and my producing partner mark clayman we really push for because I just knew he would be perfect, and he was. And he is probably the favorite of everyone who's been casted so far. Like, you know, you have people who are like, oh, I don't see this person as the character, I don't see that person as the character, but Michael Cutlass across the board, everyone loved the fact that he was casted as Jim Maddox, the dad, so I was pretty happy about that. I think the thing that shaped me most from my childhood is two different things. One of those things would be telling my mother about my sexual abuse and the way she handled it. And again, I just think it was a generational thing. It's just, you know, some things you don't talk about. And then the second would be when my dad found out. My older brother told him. And my dad was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And he was very angry. And it was just so refreshing to me that he was angry. It was very validating to me, like, okay, what happened to me was not okay. He got in his truck and he was going to drive to the person's home and confront him, but he drank because he was angry, even more than usual. And he had to pull over on the side of the road and pass out. And then the next day he came back and it was just never talked about again. And then when my daughter was born, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't repeated. I knew I couldn't do it in person to confront this person in person because I would lose my shit on them. And I knew I couldn't do like a letter because I didn't want my grandmother to find it. I knew I couldn't, I knew no one else was going to do it. So I decided to write an email to tell my grandfather that I just wanted him to know and this, there was a catalyst for this. There was a point in time where I noticed him gesturing to my oldest daughter in a similar way that he had done to me when I was younger. So I decided to write an email to let him know that in no uncertain terms that it would not be swept under the rug if I even thought he had been inappropriate with my child and that I would press charges and I would make sure he was prosecuted to the full extent of the law and he would spend the rest of his life in jail, not just for whatever he did to her, but for me as well. And it was very important to my family that my grandmother not know. So we just didn't talk about it. And everyone knew that there wasn't, there was something wrong, that I did not want a relationship with my grandfather at all. But they didn't know why and this is the first time I'm talking about it. But when I wrote that email, I called my older brother. I was having a panic attack, and I told him that I wrote the email and sent it. It was the first time it had ever even been acknowledged. He called me down, and the next day I broke the news to my mother that I had sent the email, 
and I've never seen her so angry. She was so angry with me. That was kind of the moment that I knew that even people who love you, you have to meet them where they're at. They're simply not capable of being who you need them to be. And so you have to be those things for yourself. He did email me back. He admitted to what he did and he apologized and he said if I ever wanted to talk about it, he was open to it. But I don't need to talk to him about it. He took something from me that I'll never get back. It's fine. No, I've actually really been looking forward to talking about this because I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to change my mind and panic because, you know, you get raised being told your entire life that you don't talk about it. and. I just feel like it's, it needs to be said. And now that my grandmother's passed away, I really feel like it needs to be said, so. Well, they talked about me doing a cameo and an actress I am not. You have to be vaccinated to be on set and I'm not vaccinated. So that was just a no brainer. That wasn't gonna happen. But they did put a picture of me on the wall and like insinuate that I was the, their late mother. It was a picture of actually me and my son. And so they, and so it's kind of a cameo. That's cool. but there was a time in my adult life, I think this was before I even had Haley. So it was mid 20s, early 20s. I was a stay at home mom, and my first husband was a firefighter, and he was at work, and I would watch Oprah every day. She was talking about sexual abuse, and she looked into the camera, and they just focused really tight and on her face. And she looked, I felt like she was looking straight at me. And she said, it's not your fault. And that was the first time that anyone had ever told me that, that I was a child and I didn't understand and I didn't deserve it. And it didn't even matter if like, you know, as a child, you know, things feel good and you don't understand. And I carried a lot of guilt and a lot of shame with me, especially because of my religious background. It was very confusing for you know, the, the pastor of your church to abuse you, not just abuse you at home in your safe space or in his home, which is your grandparents' home, but inside of your church. I didn't know until that moment that I didn't do anything to deserve that and it wasn't my fault and that I could let go of the shame and the guilt because I didn't own it. After my second divorce, I felt like a total failure, not just in my personal life, as a woman or a human being, I felt like I'd failed my children. And then, like I always do, bounce from one relationship to the next. I got into another relationship three months later and I've never had such low self-esteem. That's a lot of reason why I've done all this stuff to my face. <laughs> uh, all the filler and the surgeries and the rhinoplasties and uh, dyeing my hair blonde is because I just never felt like I was enough. And then when I removed myself, or the situation was removed from me, a little bit of both, from that situation and distanced myself from it, I not only realized that I could literally be at my lowest and still survive, but I started to love myself again. And I realized that I would never let anyone change that for me again knowing that I'd been through a lot in my life, but that was definitely my lowest point, in part because I had an absentee father and that relationship for me was my hope for a happy ending. The guy I was dating really reminded me of my dad in a lot of ways, and I really wanted that to be a happy ending. And when it didn't work out, it just destroyed me all over again and brought up a lot of deep childhood wounds. As low as I was, I literally thought I would never feel joy again. I just did not see the light at the end of the tubble, tunnel. And the fact that I survived that, and I didn't just survive it, it changed me and changed me for the better and to the best version of me there's ever been because it forced me to look within and self-reflect to learn to love myself again and have self-respect 
and standards. And it also gave me a different perspective for tough times. Because you know you can't see stars during the daytime. It has to be dark. And that really made me understand a lot from my childhood. Because I remember having this conversation with God and saying, you know, if, if there was a child in my home that was being hurt or abused or sexually abused, I would stop it. And I couldn't wrap my head around that because in my mind that made me more moral than God. And I realized in that moment, everything, everything just kind of came together. And that God doesn't allow bad things to happen. He brings you into that darkness so you can see clear, so you can see the light clear. The only way you can learn those lessons is by going through it and feeling the pain and the low points and the devastation. You can't appreciate how good your life is and all the wonderful things about life without having low points. It makes all the good stuff that much sweeter. 26, I'm working on my 27th. So I have uh, Apollonia, which is, it's a like a sci-fi romance. It's never really went anywhere. It, <laughs> it um, turns out my romance loving readers aren't real big on sci-fi like I am, but that's fine. Um, I still enjoyed writing it. And I wrote it really fast, and so I would like to go revisit it and kind of redo it like I did the Providence series. I went back and I re-edited the whole thing and rewrote parts of it, and it was my very first book I'd ever written, so I just wanted to improve it and fix some timeline issues because that's one of my weaknesses as an author is timeline. And so I went back and did that, and I would like to do that eventually for Apple too, but I've got so many things ahead of me that will make more money in line for my writing schedule that I probably won't get to it for a very long time. I want to write a sequel for Red Hill because that's my favorite book I've ever written. I want to write a sequel for All the Little Lights because people are asking for it. And then also I have a book called Sweet Nothing that I co-wrote and um, but it's not in print but you can get it on audiobook. Well it's no secret that I'm outspoken and I've learned in my career <laughs> to only talk about things that I'm exceptionally, exceptionally passionate about and that I believe in. I grew up in small town Oklahoma. I don't think it's a secret that I'm conservative. And in 2016, I didn't vote for Trump. I didn't vote for him until 2020 after I saw that despite his very big flaws, he made some good decisions. I found kind of a safe space to discuss my political beliefs on an app called Parlor. It's a social app, kind of like Facebook, but it's for conservatives. And I posted, I was pretty active on there, but one of my readers, or maybe they weren't my readers, they maybe they're just in the book world, they had saw those posts and they'd taken screenshots and posted them. But what really shocked me is that some of those screenshots, and to my horror, uh, were, photoshopped as being extremely racist. And the more I tried to set the record straight, the worse it got. Because a lot of those people who came at me wanted to believe that I had said those things. And, you know, I can, I can put up a side by side of like what I posted versus this, the photoshopped screenshot, but how do you prove that? And then on top of that, I had this movie deal and I was told by people close to me not to address it, that it would just go away. Kind of a full circle from my childhood. Just let them say what they want, it'll go away. But it didn't go away. You know, my friends, especially, especially my nibbling, who is uh, transgender and mixed, they see those things see that I'm transphobic or see that I'm racist. And my friends who are minorities, various minorities, and I have to explain to them that that was photoshopped and I didn't 
actually say those things. I would never say those things. And then I'll see, you know, one of my readers talk about liking my books, and then I'll see them get attacked because why would you like her book? She's a racist. Why would you like her book? She's transphobic. When I couldn't be farther from the truth than anyone who might be a minority thinking that I would ever think that way about them or add to this internal struggle that they're already going through, it, it's hard not for that to be personally heartbreaking because I would never want to be responsible for anyone for being an addition to whatever they're already going through. But if I wish anyone could know anything, it's that I would never say those things. I've never said those things before in my career. And while I am outspoken and very passionate, particularly about vaccines, race and an oppressed section of our society, I am the last person that would ever want to add to any kind of negative, I would never want to hurt somebody like that. So that's the hardest part for me, is that someone would think that I'm one of those people who feel that way about them when it's just the opposite. I want everyone to do what they want. As long as nobody's hurting kids, do what you want. I think people should have the freedom to live their life the way they want to. I was one of the first people early, early on, back in MySpace days, to advocate for gay marriage. Never had a problem with anyone being transgender. I had I mean, I'll admit, I grew up in a town. We had one black family. And I went to school with two of their children, Reggie and Jess. And I did not realize until an adult how brave they were just for existing. But I would never want to be the source of anyone feeling bad about themselves. What about for the people who say that I don't know how you dispute how they weren't photoshopped. I know what I said. People who know me know what I said. I have lots of liberal friends who know that I would never. I have lots of gay friends. I have my nibbling. That's, you don't say niece or nephew. You say my, my sibling's child, my nibbling. <laughs> they know me. So I just have to be comforted in the fact that people who love me understand that I would never do that and hoping that everybody else realizes after some time that things are not what they seem and that people who don't like you will oddly go to great lengths to make sure that other people don't also. Social media is one of my favorite things in the world and it's also the bane of my existence. I really enjoy social media. I'm, I love being able to connect with people because contrary to popular belief, I'm kind of an introvert. I like being at home and I know my social media looks like I'm just out all the time and social and I'm really not. <laughs> I'm really not. I, I, people see what I want to show them. And it's also important for a public figure to be, to stay relevant and to have their algorithm be at a certain level so that you're visible. I post a lot, but actually I don't, uh, not in the past couple of years, I haven't really gone out a lot. <laughs> it looks like I do because that's what I post, but I don't post when I'm just sitting at home. So contrary to popular belief, I am an introvert and I don't like being in the public eye, but I don't know when I'll stop being surprised at how cruel people can be behind a keyboard. I've gotten better at it. Doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt especially when people bring my kids into it or criticize my parenting or lie, just flat out lie about me. Those things, as tough as I am, they still get to me. I think that's just human. 
And I've forgiven myself for that too. Because of my childhood, I'm also very, very good at compartmentalizing and remembering that the internet is a vacuum and that the people who matter to me know me and they know better. I also wrote a, na a book under a pen name and it's erotica. That's why I wrote it under a pen name. <laughs> A pen name, so it's not under my name. It's under, which I just announced it recently, and I guess I should say admitted to it recently because I didn't want anyone to know it was me because it's erotica, and that's just not, I don't even read erotica. But um, not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just not my cup of tea. So I do a live reading every Wednesday night to my readers. They subscribe and listen to me read to a chapter of my book every night or every Wednesday night. And we do a story time before, and I call my Wednesday night besties, and it's almost kind of served as also like free therapy for me also. They're paying me, and I'm like, they're my therapist. So I'll do a story time, and then I'll read a chapter of my book. And they make fun of me, because every time I have to read the sex scenes, and I beg them to not make me, and they always make me, I hold the book up in front of my face, because I can't do it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I wrote this, this erotica book under the pen name Olivian Pope, which I don't even watch that show, but apparently there's a show with a girl on it called Olivia Pope. No clue. Uh, I just knew a girl named Olivian and Pope sounded strong and kind of contradictory because it's an erotica book. So uh, I wrote it and it's called She the Kingdom. I'm the last person to ask about making a marriage last. But if I could talk about my experiences and what I've learned, it's to go into it not expecting the other person to make you happy. It's to go into it expecting to give 90% and getting back 10. It's to marry someone who is emotionally mature and capable of not just listening but comprehending what you're saying. Someone who will listen to your childhood traumas and use it to better understand you and not use it against you. What am I most grateful for? I'm grateful for Twilight. I'm grateful for people liking what I write. I'm grateful that I have a knack for getting in on things at just the right time. When I first started writing, self-publishing was still a dirty word. And I'm grateful that I made the friends that I did that elevated me to be visible enough for more people to be exposed to my books and that my love for making up stories because that's always what I've done since I was little. I just play pretend all the time. My penchant for people watching and understanding people and the human condition and what makes people tick. Embracing people's flaws and how that makes them strong and understanding and patient instead of mean and understanding that people's flaws don't make them bad people. It just makes them interesting. I'm grateful for all of those things so that I could have a career in which I could stay home and raise my children and give them things that I never had as a child and be able myself to experience things that I would have never been able to experience otherwise. So I guess in a way I'm grateful for my trauma and I'm grateful for that's a strong word, being grateful for trauma, but had those things not happened, it wouldn't mold me into the person who needed to escape reality that created me into this person who writes stories, a storyteller that creates an escape for other people that they enjoy and then I can make a career out of it. It's interesting because I'm a romance author and I've had one failed relationship after another. Ironically, Fiction is the only place where I feel like love is real. It's Happenstance series, the Beautiful series, the Maddox Brothers series, uh, the Crash and Burn series, and then the standalones I have, Apollonia, Sweet Nothing, Thing and All the Little Lights, which is was published by Amazon. And they actually did a really good job marketing that and putting oomph behind it, so. I wouldn't mind working with them again. What's next right now, like I said, I'm working on the third book, the Crash and Burn series, and then after that I'm gonna start writing sequels for the Maddox Brothers books. Then I'd like to write a prequel for Abby, who's the female lead in Beautiful Disaster, and a book for, kind of a prequel that's for the dad, Jim Maddox, and his late wife, Diane. 
So I'd like to write those. Then I'd like to write a sequel for Red Hill and fix Apollonia and write a sequel for that. And then I have a bunch of ideas. I'm not going to tell you the titles though because people tend to take them. Um, I'm, I've got a bunch of ideas and then I'm in talks with certain people to actually write books for them that will be adapt for the purpose of being adapted to film. What's next for me? I have a movie coming out in theaters April 12th. We just wrapped the second movie. Love to do a third one and a fourth and a fifth. And I'm in talks for another series of mine. I would really like to gravitate towards screenwriting. I've got a whole list of books that I still need to finish. And for right now, I'll be raising my son. And then when he graduates, I'll probably sell everything I own and travel the world. I have done a lot of things that weren't even on my bucket list that are amazing. I've hiked Machu Picchu. I've backpacked across Peru with my oldest daughter. I've taken my middle child, Haley, I've taken her to Rome. I've gone to New York. I've gone to Paris. I've gone to London. I've gone to Brazil. I've snorkeled in Trunk Bay, which Twilight was filmed their honeymoon in St. John. I've been to St. Thomas. I've snorkeled in Belize with Haley. I've done all these things I didn't even know were on my bucket list that were just absolutely amazing. Uh, I've, there are places that I want to go and experiences that I want to have, but I don't just want to pigeonhole it to a bucket list. I just, wherever life takes me and wherever I end up, I want it to be the best day of my life. And I want to keep having those. So wherever it is that I'm at or whatever I'm doing, that's the bucket list, is to be happy. Um, thank you. You've changed my life. And you're all very good to me, and you're very supportive and understanding. And I wouldn't be where I am right now if it weren't for you. Thank you.